So uh, church offices, we're going to begin. We've kind of been using 1 Timothy as our springboard for this study. And uh, so as we continue on in that thought, we're going to look now at chapter number three that deals with the only two church offices that are set forth for us in the New Testament church. And so we're going to we're going to read this entire text just as just to start us off. Um, and then we're going to back up and and um, look specifically at the first portion here. This is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine, no striker, not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous, one that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. So verses 1 through 7 deal with our first church office, which here is called the office of the bishop. And then beginning in verse number 8, we get to the second church office. Likewise, must the deacons be grave, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy of filthy lucre, holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience, and let these also first be proved. Then let them use the office of a deacon being found blameless. Uh, the deacons, we also have responsibilities for their wives set forth. Even so must their wives be grave, not slanderers, sober, faithful in all things. Let the deacons be the husbands of one wife, ruling their children and their own houses well. For they that have used the office of a deacon well purchase to themselves a good degree and great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. And, uh, and just to remind you, if we go on reading a couple more verses, these things write out unto thee, hoping to come unto thee shortly. But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. And so if you remember, that's how we started this entire study with that verse there. This letter here, he's writing to Timothy so that you might understand how to behave in the house of God. There is an order as the church assembles together. And, and we said at the very outset of this, it's been a while since we've been here, so I want us to be reminded of this. Why are we studying church order? Well, because God does set forth an order, right? And God would have us to do all things decently and in in order and because we understand to obey is better than sacrifice right so we can come together in a religious form but if it's out of order and we're not coming together in a way that's pleasing to God obedience is what the Lord expects that is better than sacrifice so our last uh, subject we looked at was on the topic of prayer in the assembly we went I don't know maybe eight weeks through that looked at uh, prayer and public prayer and versus private prayer and all these things and so now we want to look at church offices as as I said there's only two offices listed here the bishops and the deacons uh, did you notice one office that we find uh, within the New Testament church is the office of the apostle we don't have the qualifications of an apostle why is that because we don't have apostles anymore all right. We don't have apostles anymore, and that's why we don't have the qualifications for them. Look at Acts chapter 1. I just thought this was worth mentioning here. I've never really considered this text as a proof for the fact that we don't have apostles anymore, but this would be our text, and 1 Timothy would be a good one to use. If we still have apostles, where are the qualifications of the apostles? We don't have them anymore. That's why Paul didn't list those here. In Acts chapter 1 and in verse 21, uh, we, we read, as they are replacing Judas here, Wherefore of these men which have accompanied with us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John unto the same day that he was taken up from us, must one be ordained to be a witness with us of his resurrection. The, these men that were apostles, they had personal contact with Jesus Christ. They were eyewitnesses of Jesus Christ. They were eyewitnesses of his resurrection resurrection. Uh, let, let me show you that in 1 Corinthians 15 uh, in case any of you are wondering about what about the Apostle Paul? He kind of came on the scene late. Well, he confesses that about himself, but listen 
to what he says in 1 Corinthians 15 and in verse number 4 as he speaks of the resurrection of Christ, that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And so after this resurrection, he was seen of Cephas, that is Peter, then of the twelve. After that, he was seen of above 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. After that, he was seen of James, then of all the apostles. And last of all, he was seen of me also as of one born out of, time, of due time. For I am the least of the apostles and am not meet or fit to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. So Paul admits I was kind of added on there at the very end, but I still, that qualification has still been satisfied in that I saw the Lord Jesus Christ. I had personal contact with Jesus Christ uh, as he was on the road to Damascus there. And so he was an eyewitness of Christ's resurrection. So the apostles were eyewitnesses of the resurrection and they were also endued by Jesus with miraculous abilities to accompany the preaching of the gospels. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter number 12. 2 Corinthians chapter number 12. And in verse number 12, as Paul is writing to the Corinthian church, a, a, a church that uh, repeatedly undervalued the apostle and his ministry, we've, we've got more written to the Corinthian church by the apostle Paul than, than any other church. It was a church full of issues and problems, um, and, and yet Paul's love for them is seen in the, in the way that he, in the length of the letters that he wrote to them, and in, in the great care that he had for them. And in verse number 12, as he is, uh, he's, he's, he said, it's it is not expedient for me doubtless to glory in verse number one. He goes, I don't want to set myself forth, but you guys aren't listening to what I'm saying. He said, you're listening to everybody else. And he goes, I want you to understand there's a distinction in my ministry from these that you are following after that are really false prophets. And he says in verse 12, truly the signs of an apostle were wrought among you. I, I evidenced by the, uh, by the testimony uh, that I had among you, by the way that the gospel was preached by me among you uh, in all patience in signs and wonders and mighty deeds. He said the preaching of the gospel was accompanied by these miraculous signs. That was unique to the apostles. That was given uniquely to the apostles as the gospel went forth to validate that they were the ones that Christ had chosen upon whom he would establish, he would found his church. We're founded upon, uh, we're established upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone. So we don't have apostles anymore. We don't have anybody that meets these qualifications anymore. So the, the qualifications for the office of the apostle are not given. But I do want us to see this because we're going to be looking at the apostles from time to time in this study. Look at 1 Peter chapter number 5. Even though we don't have apostles among us anymore, we still can look at the apostles to understand how the elders should behave in the church and how the church should relate to them. In uh, 1 Peter chapter number 5, listen to what Peter calls himself here as he writes to this group of elders. The elders which are among you I exhort who am also, and what? Elder. Elder. Peter refers to himself as an elder also and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. And so he gives some specific instruction to the elders there, which we'll, we'll come back to at some point in our study. And then uh, while we're over here, look at 2 John. In 2 John, the Apostle John also refers to himself in this fashion. At the beginning of 2 and 3 John, it reads identically at the beginning here, he writes of himself, the elder unto the elect lady. And third John, the elder unto the well-beloved Gaius. So they refer to themselves as elders as well. And we can look at their lives as a pattern for uh, the, uh, the, the present day bishops and elders. Um, let's look in Titus chapter number one. And I just want us to see this before we jump into a further study of this first church office, Titus chapter 1. And I want us to understand the weight of this first office. In Titus chapter 1, as Paul writes to Titus here, and this is another section that we're going to have to come to as we consider bishops and elders. 
because we have qualifications listed here also as he wrote to Titus. But I want you to see that the, what the first order of business was as Paul writes to Timothy uh, and, and as he's establishing church order uh, here in Crete. Uh, he says, verse number five, For this cause left I thee in Crete that thou shouldest set in order. What are we studying? Church order, right? That thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting and do what? Ordain elders. The first thing that he sets forth here uh, as, as Titus is to establish order here in Crete, the first course of business was to ordain elders. Ordain elders in every city as I had appointed thee. So we understand the weight of this office. He said, Titus, start here. Um, so it's a crucial office. It's important. Um, and we need to understand the weight of that as we study this first office set forth. So just a few things I want to consider in Titus. My, my plan, my goal is to go through these lists of qualifications with both the elders or, or the bishops and the deacons as we consider each one. Um, that's my intention, is to look at each of those and perhaps consider examples of each of those uh, qualifications as we see those in the lives of the apostles and, and of other elders. But I do want us to see this also, if you'll go with me to 1 Peter chapter number 2. 1 Peter chapter number 2. I had to look that up on my phone because it didn't make it into my printed notes. In 1 Peter chapter number 2, I want us to see what, it, when we study the office of the bishop, the office of the elder, it, it is in fact a study into the character and the person of Jesus Christ. And we, we see that very clearly here in 1 Peter chapter number 2. Because he is the great elder, right? He is the great bishop. Uh, uh, 1 Peter chapter number 2 and in verse number 25, For ye were as sheep going astray, but are now returned unto the shepherd. Hold on to that. We're going to revisit that, that term, that, uh, that title in a moment. You have now returned unto the shepherd and the what? The bishop. Of your souls. That's our same word there in 1 Timothy where he sets forth the qualifications of the bishop. Uh, so the great bishop is none other than Christ himself. So when we look at these qualifications, these qualities, when we look at this role, Christ is ultimately the example and we're studying the character and the person of Jesus Christ as we consider that. Um, so let's go, let's go back to our text now. Uh, you know what, as we're going back, so that, back there, I want you to stop off in Titus because I want you to see this quickly. In Titus chapter 1, in Titus chapter 1, in verse number 5, we've already read verse number 5, I left you in Crete to ordain elders. I want us to understand this. We can use elders and bishops interchangeably. This is one place you see that. You'll also find it in Acts chapter 20. Um, where both terms are used to the elders and the bishops in, um, in Ephesus. They're not in the same verse, but if you read that section, you'll see that. And Titus 1.5, he says, I want you to ordain elders. And then he begins to give the qualifications in verse 6. If any man be blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of right or unruly, for a bishop must be blameless as the steward of God. So they are one in the same office. Some churches have made a distinction there. I don't find that in the Scripture. They're one and the same, bishops and elders. Uh, and the term that we're more familiar with, in our Baptist circles anyway, that's most frequently used, the term pastor, which we're going to talk about in a second. So in our text, in, in 1 Timothy chapter number 3, we read concerning this office, and the first verse here, this is a true saying, if a man desire the office of a bishop or an elder, or a pastor, he desireth a good work. What, what do these names mean? Let's look at these names uh, briefly to understand what they mean. Elders. The term elders, it simply means older. It, senior, a person that is senior in age uh, is often in the Scriptures referred to as an elder. It's the same exact Greek word. There's not a distinction between the church office and just someone that is older. You have to understand it in the context of the way that it's presented. It simply means older. It's also a term, especially in the Gospels, that refers to the members of the Jewish Sanhedrin. 
So he may talk about the priest and the elders. He's talking about those ruling group of Jews there that, that made judgment uh, among the Jews, the Sanhedrin. So elders also refers to that in the scripture. In 1 Timothy chapter number 4, uh, and uh, this is in the same book, right, as what we're looking at, 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy 3, as he gives the qualifications of a bishop, which we've seen is also elders. He does use the word elders in 1 Timothy, but it's translated differently. Uh, 1 Timothy 4 and in verse number 14, he writes to Tim Timothy, Neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee by prophecy, with the laying on of the hands of the presbytery. So this presbytery here is the exact same Greek word elder. In fact, the Greek word that sounds like that. I'm not going to say it out loud because if Nico were to hear that word, I would be scrutinized and I'd, I'd be in a lot of trouble because I wouldn't pronounce it correctly. But if you were to look at it in the Greek, you'd see very clearly it's where we get that word, presbytery. It almost sounds the, sounds the same. Um, you know, Presbyterian would come from that. So that's what an elder means. And when you read this word, this is the only place it's translated this way, way in verse 14 here. Uh, it is, in fact, the word Elder. What about the term bishops? Strong's defines bishops as a superintendent. And I'll show you one other way that that word is translated in the English. Look at Acts chapter 20. Acts 20. This is the same word bishop here, the same Greek word. And in Acts 20 and in verse number 28, uh, it's translated in a way that conveys that thought of superintendent. Uh, in Acts 20 and in verse number 28, uh, let me get in the right chapter. Acts 20 and verse number 28. Take heed therefore unto yourselves. This is where he's writing to the Ephesians as he's speaking to them, uh, which, he, which he calls the elders in verse 17 uh, of Ephesus. In verse 28, take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you what? Overseers. So the word bishop uh, is the same word. A Greek word here that's translated overseers uh, to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. So it, it, like I said, Strong's defines that as a superintendent. An overseer uh, is what bishop means. And then finally, the word, like I said, that we are most familiar with, especially in our Baptist circles, but is only found one time in the scriptures translated this way. It's Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. And so we can think of these terms as all one and the same. Ephesians 4 and in verse number 11, and he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some what? Pastors. pastors. Some pastors. And, and by the way, in, in the uh, my, uh, my Greek friend <laughs> uh, says very clearly that pastors and teachers there, when you look at the Greek language, those, that's one and the same. So we're not talking about two different offices there. Pastors and teachers, the pastors are teachers. We're going to see that in the, in the qualifications of the bishops and elders as we look at that. But it is the term pastors. Like I said, we're most <laughs> familiar with that. But this is the only time it's used. And it is, in fact, literally the word shepherd. You know, I told you to hold on to that when we saw Christ as the shepherd and bishop of our souls. That word shepherd there is this word pastor here. So they are shepherds uh, uh, over the church. And we saw that there as he spoke to the Ephesian elders. And he says, I want you to feed the flock of God. They are functioning as shepherds among the sheep of God's Fold. Now, what did we see in 1 Timothy chapter 3 regarding this uh, office of a bishop? We found out that it is a good thing to desire this work. Did you, do you remember reading that? If a man desire the office of a bishop, it is a good thing. It's a good thing for him to desire that. In fact, it is an act of love. What did Jesus tell Peter in John 21? Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Right? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my sheep. The word feed in that particular verse, by the way, in John 21 and verse number 16, is where it, it comes directly from our word shepherd. It means to tend the sheep, to shepherd the sheep. Um, uh, to, to pastor them, to feed them is what the other words feed mean in that uh, section. But that one word that comes there in the middle of that, if you look at it when he said that to Peter three times, the one that comes in the middle the second time when he says, feed my sheep, it is in fact a different Greek word that comes directly from our word shepherd here. So it is an act of love 
for one to shepherd the flock. It is a good thing to desire this work, but I want us to also understand that a warning comes with this office. And look at James chapter number 3. James chapter number 3. There is a serious, it is, it is a good thing to desire it. He desires a good thing, 1 Timothy 3 said. It is an act of love to participate, to function properly in this role, but there is also a warning in it. Uh, as James sets forth here in, in chapter 3, My brethren, be not many masters, be not many teachers, knowing that we shall receive what? The greater condemnation. There's a greater responsibility there. There is greater condemnation there for one that would handle that role improperly. So James says, hey, you need to think about that before you decide that this is something you want to be involved in. Just like Jesus said, count the calls. Uh, it, it, the, the work of a shepherd, the work of a pastor, of an elder, of a bishop is a calling. It's not just a, you look at all the jobs out there and you decide on which one you want to take. This is a serious matter. This is something which God calls an individual into. And so it's a big deal for, uh, for we talked about ordaining elders for the church to put their hand forth and say, this individual is an elder among us, a bishop, a shepherd, a pastor. And it is a big deal for that individual in that role. It's a serious matter. And then the last thing I want us to see, this is all we have time for this morning in 1 Timothy chapter 3. I read these together in regarding the elders uh, or the bishops. I keep using the wrong word because he uses bishops there. But the bishops and elders compared to the deacons. In 1 Timothy 3, you may have noticed that everything is singular in the first part of this text as he speaks of the bishop. This is a true saying if a man, a single man, desire the office of a bishop, singular, and then he says a bishop, singular, must uh, then must be, and he goes on with those qualifications. Well, in contrast to that in verse 8, he says, likewise must the deacons. Here the word is plural. It's not singular like it was with the bishop. So the implication there, uh, it may seem that the idea is that there's a single elder, there's a single bishop within the assembly. But we find very clearly as we look at various passages that that was not the case in the early church. Look at Acts chapter 15 and in verse number 4. Acts chapter 15 and verse number 4. We find that in the very first Christian church, the church here in Jerusalem, that there were multiple elders among the people. Acts 15 and in verse number 4. Um, and when they were come to Jerusalem, they were received by the church and of the apostles and what? Elders, right? So plural, elders. And they declared all things that God had done with them. Look at Philippians chapter number 1. Philippians chapter number 1. As Paul opens his letter to the church at Philippi, he writes, Paul and Timotheus, the servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus which are at Philippi, with the who? Bishops, Bishops and deacons. So again, plural. There were multiple uh, there at Philippi. And then finally, in Ephesus, in Acts chapter 20, we were here earlier but didn't read this specific verse. Acts chapter 20. And in verse number 17, and from Miletus, he sent to Ephesus and called the who of the church? The elders. So again, we had plural, multiple elders among the church there at Ephesus. These were pastors. These were shepherds, as we said, that tended the flock. This is where we also see overseers, plural, that we read earlier in verse 28, which we said was actually the word bishop. So there were multiple elders among these churches. The office of a bishop is not a singular thing. There were multiple uh, among several of these, starting in Jerusalem, then also in Philippi, and as well at Ephesus. And that makes sense, right? Uh, the, the, this supporting role with elders and deacons also, it's appropriate. It's, it's beneficial to have more than one to bear that burden, to hold one another accountable, to lead if something happens to one. It makes perfect sense that God would not have the sheep without one to function in that role as a shepherd. 
Um, so we see just as we saw a multiplicity of deacons, we saw all, uh, also a multiplicity of elders among the early churches. That's all we have time to get into today. I want to look at specifically at the function of the bishops and the elders, Lord willing, next week. I haven't decided yet how we want to do that. We want to look at the qualifications as well, and so maybe we'll consider the function of the elders as we look at the qualifications for them. But Lord willing, we're going to jump into that list um, next week of what the various qualifications were.